U.S. Congress. Please welcome Chaplain Endell Lee. Thank you, Judge. I'm going to greet you, and I want you to sound off with a loud and vigorous hoorah. Good morning, Marines. Hoorah. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Now all those folks that were sleeping awake, they're, they're awake now. First, I want to thank you for your service and sacrifice for what you do for the cause of freedom around the globe. It helps my family sleep better at night. I don't consider myself a hero, but a hero helper. And I've been privileged to walk alongside people like you and see you serve and see your dedication and devotion. With that in mind, I want to thank you for your time and attention for this next little while this morning. I do not take that for granted. I have walked alongside folks like you. And as the judge mentioned, there are some folks uh, that are different from you that I can't really talk about this morning. But I hope that my story and insights will be of benefit to you. There's a variety of ways in our culture today by which we gain understanding. Many times uh, we read books, uh, and there are a lot of good books out there on the topics that I'm going to be sharing about. Combat Stress, uh, written by Dr. Nash. Uh, the Code of the Warrior, written by Dr. Shannon French. Movies are a popular way for us to gain insight and attention these days, in particular young people like those. One of the more popular ones recently has been The Hurt Locker, and people have gained insight into the demands and dynamics, at least of one group of people who serve in that capacity. And then another way to, to get it is to live it. Well, I'll say to you this morning, uh, I've not written any books. I'm not a rock star. I'm not in any movies although I have at least made it to the big screen today. Uh, and uh, I'll have to say that the perspective that I come from is just having lived it and figured it out some along the way. So with that in mind, I'll say to you that there's a word out there called homeostasis in the books that they talk about. And it, it's a fancy word from which we get our word balance, stasis really means in the Latin balance, and homeo has to do with humanity or personhood. So it's a, it's a $10 word for what I would call personal balance, and this is a key to dealing with the things that uh, we have to deal with, particularly as we come back from combat settings. There are ways we check our personal balance in a variety of ways. In physical terms, many of us, you've seen this, you would put finger on a pulse, make sure there's pulse there. or there's breath. You might put your cheek next to someone's nose to make sure there's breath there. Mentally, we check by simply asking a few questions, such as, what day is it? Who's the president of the United States? How many fingers am I holding up? Those kind of things help us to know in the categories of being how we're doing. Now, there's a word that's very familiar to you, I trust. Uh, it is to me from my background and experience uh, that helps me think through these categories. It is the word simper related to your word for Semper Fi, always faithful. Coast Guard has a similar phrase, Semper Paratus, which means always ready. And it's this word Semper I want to build off a little bit. You know this morning, uh, based on the Latin, it means always. And I want to talk to you about Semper Stasis, or always being balanced. To break it down by acronym, as we often do in the military, the S would stand for the spiritual component in our lives. The E would stand for the emotional component in our lives. The M would represent for us the mental balance and well-being that we have. The P would then, of course, address the physical aspects. The second E for me, as I relate to it, stands for the everyday struggles and trials that we have, and also the emergent, the crises that suddenly penetrate our lives, sometimes unexpectedly. Uh, and that happens in an environment. Sometimes that environment is here sitting at a table. Sometimes it's far, far away in the midst of a dust storm when we're not even sure we can see our enemy. And then the R stands for the relation aspects of our lives, the social choices that we make and how we interact with others in that context. And what I would say to you is it's always a challenge for us to know 
where we are across that word to make sure that we are stable and maintaining proper bearing. Combat operational stress is a set of lenses that has been developed for us to help us deal with that and understand it and create a common language so we can talk to each other about it. There are four major stressors. If you're in this room, you should have seen those slides by now. So I'm not going to put those PowerPoints back in front of you today, but I'm going to try, try to jog your memory a bit. And you'll remember that the first of those is life threat. And if you've been in a combat situation, you've been in a life-threatening situation. Rockets in the camp, kicking in doors. It can be as simple as just taking a ride down the highway, much like driving in L.A., as we've heard this morning. Okay? It, it comes to us in all fashions of life. But life threat is one of the major causes for us in combat and operational settings. The second is grief. And grief will be defined as any kind of significant loss. And that significant loss is defined by the person experiencing the loss. And we have to appreciate that. The judge told us this morning that uh, if you were to hurt a puppy in her presence, that that would create great grief and reaction on her part because of her feeling and affinity. Now, some of you may not have that same feeling about puppies, but you have it about other things. So grief and loss is a major contributor and causes us to escalate sometimes. Moral injury is another way that we experience stress. It is when our belief system is infringed upon. We all have a worldview, lenses by which we see life, a way we look at it. I had a great uh, psych friend of mine describe it this way to a group of SEALs one time, and I was like, man, that makes very good sense, and it was a very clear picture. He says, we all have this box that we live in with a framework to it. And sometimes things happen that are outside of that box. There's an explosion or an incident or an event, or however you choose to describe it. And what we have to do with our belief system is we have to click on that event and try to drag it into our box so it'll make sense so that we can live with it, so that we can process it. Sometimes we click and drag, and sometimes we click and drag, and it just won't move. You've experienced that on the computer before. You know what I'm talking about. And in those instances, we, we begin to be challenged in news ways, and we have to think about how do we make our box bigger sometimes to incorporate that bit. How do we make the adjustments in our thinking and our boundaries of life so that we can absorb those events and help them to make sense with our beliefs? Because if we don't, we find ourselves in constant turmoil and our soul feels an anxiety and an anxiousness that goes on continually. And then the fourth major stressor is the wear and tear. It's the multiple crises, one after another, over a lengthy period of time that begin to just take the life out of you. We now have been involved in one of the longest engagements we've been in as a country. Though we've had many others in our history, and some in some ways more intense by different measurements, this is a rough, rough fight. How's this? I'll keep going, folks. All right, a rough, rough fight with the wear and tear. And we've actually learned with these four categories that we can measure this and we made it real simple by, for Marines by putting it in color. Again, you've seen this slide, right? Green, yellow, orange, and red. And as we deal with those categories and try to work with them, we've learned that there are pattern responses that tend to occur. In the green, we say you're relatively stable and good to go. You can function at an optimum level to complete the mission. In the yellow zone, you're hurting a bit, but you're still functional and you can continue forward in the mission. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you adjusting that. I don't want to see you go to jail, man. <laughs> <laughs> Ten days is a long time, and that's it, if you're not prepared. All right. The third color scheme that you're familiar with is the orange zone. And that's where things are starting to get a little shaky, a little wobbly, and you're on the edge, so to speak. Uh, and, and at any moment, something could, could spark, and then boom, that explosion happens, and you react in a way that may or may not be appropriate. And then we're all familiar with the, with the red zone where something has broke. And the picture in the slides is that tree that's been bent, 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 and then suddenly it snapped. 
like a tree in a hurricane or a tornado. And we've got to do something major, fast, to help that situation. We've got to do some major intervention and prepare work. Two things that help us deal with these kind of dynamics on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly the intensity of combat, is unit cohesion and personal balance. Unit cohesion and personal balance. Well, you know as I know, I've been doing this for about 29 years now and in the reserves, and unit cohesion is a tremendous challenge except when you're downrange. Because what happens, as soon as you come back, you're dispersed pretty quickly. And if you're an IA, you went by yourself and came back. I've had that experience twice where I didn't even have those folks with me on a day-to-day -day basis again. And then we're spread back out into our civilian population, and those folks just don't get it. And it's a tremendous challenge. Because the unit cohesion is diminished some, then we must work harder to reinforce our sense of personal balance. And what I want to do here in just the next little bit is focus on the S of that word simper because it has become a strong point for me. Many times this is soul balance that sustains you, stabilizes you, and strengthens you when nothing else will. When for whatever reason you just can't make sense of it, when you can't wrap your mind around it and get it back in all the categories again, the soul balance will help you hold on. When your emotions are raw and you think you just can't take anything else, sometimes it's the spiritual aspect that helps you just bear up. And when you feel like your heart has been squeezed so hard that you think the life is about gone completely out of it, it is the nurturing of the spirit that will cause you to well up and do things that you did not think were possible. Now let me say to you, most people, it seems, have a binge and purge form of spirituality. We binge in a crisis, and then we purge after the crisis is over, and we say, oh, I got it from here. Oh, God, help me. Or whatever resources you're using, you're like, oh, help me, help me, help me. And then whew, everything eases off a little bit, and you got, hey, I got it from here. Thanks for checking in with me. We do that. It's human nature. We do that in our physical being many times as well. Uh, let me give you a description. I'll give you a Navy example. We, like you, are required to run a physical fitness exam a couple of times a year. And what I have watched with my Navy brethren, my cousins, so to speak, in the middle, members' services, uh, what will happen is they will all begin to build up month or two out and they'll start getting ready. You may do the same thing. You may start working harder and pressing harder so you can get that score you want. But then as soon as they pass the exam, they, as soon as they take the test, then, whew, oh, man, I, I'm good again, and I don't have to do that again for another six months. And some of them will even stop running or exercising completely for the next three or four months, and then they got to start all over with that pain again, trying to get up to the point where they can just pass the test. Now, I know Marines aren't like that. We try to keep a more even balance with our physical component over time. But I would say to you, in other categories, we do find ourselves being strained. And what I want to suggest is that we have a more balanced approach, particularly in our spirituality, or a more healthy diet, if you will. And speaking of diet, um, I want to kind of angle my discussion here along the lines of this idea of having dessert with the puzzle maker. Now, when I say dessert, I know what you're thinking, ice cream, cake, you know, cobbler, maybe some candy or jello. And those of you who are real healthy, maybe your, your mind's going to fruit. But when I think of dessert, it represents so much more in my life. And that comes from an experience of going to my grandmother's house when I was a young boy. We would work hard on the farm all day, and do our chores and get the things accomplished. Then she would cook a wonderful supper at night, cornbread and those kind of things. I'm from the South, as you can tell now by the accent. Uh, and after supper was over and the dishes were done and everything kind of settled in for the evening, she would usually break out something just a little bit extra. Down in New Orleans, we like to call this lanyap. Uh, it might be just a bowl of uh, her favorite potato chips, or uh, it might be some blueberries that we picked uh, out of the garden that day with some sugar sprinkled on top, strawberries. Uh, or if it was a real special night, uh, we would uh, maybe break out the ice cream. And what would happen alongside of that time 
is that she would begin